All right, my beautiful people. So I'm on page 30 of Speak by Lori Hall Sanderson. We're going to page 46. And I just thought that an audiobook might help with comprehension and with listening and with understanding. So I'm on page 30. The opposite of, ex of inspiration <coughs> is expiration. For a solid week, ever since the pep rally, I've been painting watercolors of trees that have been hit by lightning. I try to paint them so they are nearly dead, but not totally. Mr. Freeman doesn't say a word to me about them. He just raises his eyebrows. One picture is so dark you can barely see the tree at all. We are all floundering. Ivy pulled clowns as her assignment. Remember, Ivy's like an old friend. She tells Mr. Freeman she hates clowns. A clown scared her when she was a little girl, and it put her into therapy. Mr. Freeman says fear is a great place to begin art. Another girl whines that brain is just too gross a subject for her. She wants kittens or rainbows. Mr. Freeman throws his hands in the air. Enough. Please turn your attention to the bookshelves. We dutifully turn and stare. Books. This is an art class. Why do we need books? If you are stumped, you may take some time to study the masters. He pulls out an armful. Kahlo, Monet, O'Keeffe, Pollock, Picasso, Dolly. They did not complain about subject. They mined every subject for the root of its meaning. Of course, they didn't have a school board forcing them to paint with both hands tied behind their backs. They had patrons who understood the need to pay for basic things, such as paper and paint. We groan. He's off on the school board thing again. The school board has cut his supply budget, telling him to make do with the stuff left over from last year. No new paint, no extra paper. He'll rant for the rest of the period, 43 minutes. The room is warm, filled with sun and paint fumes. Three kids fall dead asleep, eye twitches, snores, and everything. Never in my class. I stay awake. I take out a page of notebook paper and a pen and doodle a tree, my second grade version. Hopeless, I crumple it into a ball and take out another sheet. How hard can it be to put a tree on a piece of paper? Two vertical lines for the trunk, maybe some thick branches, a bunch of thinner branches, and plenty of leaves to hide the mistakes. I draw a horizontal line for the ground and a daisy popping up next to the tree. Somehow I don't think Mr. Freeman is going to find much emotion in it. I don't find any. He stared out as he started out as such a cool teacher. Is he going to make us thrash around with this ridiculous assignment without helping us? Acting. We get a day off for Columbus Day. I go to Heather's house. I wanted to sleep in, but Heather's really, really, really wanted me to come over. There's nothing on television anyway. Heather's mom acts very excited to see me. She makes us mugs of hot chocolate to take upstairs and tries to convince Heather to invite a whole group for a sleepover. Maybe, maybe Melly could bring some of her friends. I don't mention the possibility that Rachel would slit my throat on her new carpet. I show my teeth like a good girl. Her mother pats my cheek. I'm getting better at smiling when people expect it. Heather's room is finished and ready for viewing. It does not look like a fifth grader's or a ninth grader's. It looks like a commercial for vacuum cleaners, all fresh paint and vacuum cleaner lines in the carpet. The lilac walls have a few artsy prints on them. Her bookcase has glass doors. She has a television and a phone, and her homework is neatly laid out on her desk. Her closet is open just a tad. I open it farther with my foot. All her clothes wait patiently on hangers, organized by type, skirts together, pants hanging by their cuffs, her sweater stacked in plastic bags on shelves. The room screams Heather. Why can't I figure out how to do that? Not that I want my room screaming Heather. That would be too creepy. But a little whisper of Melinda would be nice. I sit on the floor flipping through her CDs. Heather paints her nails on her desk blotter and blathers. She is determined to sign up for the musical. The music wingers are a hard clan to break into. Heather doesn't have talent or connections. I tell her she is wasting her time to even think of it. She thinks we should try out together. I think she has been breathing too much hairspray. My job is to nod or shake my head to say, I know what you mean when I don't, and that is so unfair, when it isn't. The musical world would be easy for me. I am a good actor. I have a whole range of smiles. I use the shy, look up through the bang smile for staff members, and the crinkly eye smile with a quick shake of my head if a teacher asks me for an answer. If my parents want to know how school went, I flash my eyebrows upward and shrug my shoulders. When people point at me or whisper as I walk past, I wave to imaginary friends down the hall and hurry to meet them. If I drop out of high school, I could be a mime. Heather asks why I don't think they would let us into the musical. I sip my hot chocolate. It burns the roof of my mouth. Me. 
we are nobody. Heather, how can you say that? Why does everyone have that attitude? I don't understand any of this. If we want to be in the musical, then they should let us. We could just stand on stage or something if they don't like our singing. It's not fair. I hate high school. She pushes her books to the floor and knocks the green nail polish on the sand-colored carpet. Why is it so hard to make friends here? Is there something in the water? In my old school, I could have gone out for the musical and worked on the newspaper and chaired the car wash. Here, people don't even know I exist. I get squished in the hall and I don't belong anywhere and nobody cares. And you're no help. You are so negative and you never try anything. You just mope around like you don't care that people talk about you behind your back. She flops on her bed and bursts into sobs. Big boo-hoos with little squeals of frustration when she punches her teddy bear. I don't know what to do. I try to soak up the nail polish, but I make the stain bigger. It looks like algae. Heather wipes her nose on the bear's plaid scarf. I slip out to the bathroom and come back with another box of tissues and a bottle of nail polish remover. Heather, I am so sorry, Melly. I can't believe I said those things to you. It's PMS. Don't pay attention to me. You have been so sweet to me. You are the only person I can trust. She blows her nose loudly and wipes her eyes on her sleeve. Look at you. You're just like my mom. She says, no use crying. Get on with your life. I know what we'll do. First, we'll work our way into a good group. We'll make them like us. By next year, the music wieners will be begging us to be in the musical. It is the most hopeless idea I have ever heard, but I nod and pour the remover on the carpet. It lightens the polish to a bright vomit green and bleaches the carpet surrounding it. When Heather sees what I have done, she bursts into tears again, sobbing that it isn't my fault. My stomach is killing me. Her room isn't big enough for this much emotion. I leave without saying goodbye. Dinner theater. The parents are making threatening noises, turning dinner into performance art, with dad doing his Arnold Schwarzenegger imitation and mom playing Glenn Close in one of her psycho roles. I am the victim. Mom. Creepy smile. Thought you could pull one over on us, did you, Melinda? Big high school student now. Don't need to show your homework to your parents. Don't need to show us any failing test grades. Dad, bangs table, silverware jumps. Cut the crap. She knows what's up. The interim reports came today. Listen to me, young lady. I'm only going to say this once. You get those grades up or your name is mud. Hear me? Get them up. Attacks baked potato. Mom, annoyed at being upstaged. I'll handle this. Melinda? She smiles. Audience shudders. We're not asking for much, dear. We just want you to do your best, and we know your best is much better than this. You tested so well, dear. Look at me when I talk to you. Victim mixes cottage cheese into applesauce. Dad snorts like a bull. Mom grasps knife. Mom, I said look at me. Victim mixes peas into applesauce and cottage cheese. Dad stops eating. Mom, look at me now. This is the death voice, the voice that means business. When I was a kid, this voice made me pee in my pants. It takes more now. I look mom square in the eye, then rinse my plate and retreat to my room. Deprived of victim, mom and dad holler at each other. I turn up the music to drown out the noise. Blue Roses. After last night's interrogation, I try to pay attention in biology. We are studying cells, which of all these tiny parts you can't see unless you look at them under a microscope. We get to use real microscopes, not plastic Kmart specials. It's not bad. Mrs. Keene is our teacher. I feel kind of sad for her. She could have been a famous scientist or doctor or something. Instead, she is stuck with us. She has wooden boxes all over the front of the room that she climbs on when she talks to us. If she'd cut back on the donuts, she'd look like a tiny grandmother doll. Instead, she has a gelatinous figure, usually encased in orange polyester. Ugh. She avoids basketball players. From their perspective, she must look like a basketball. I have a lab partner, David Petrakis, belongs to the Cyber Genius Clan. He has the potential to be cute when the braces come off. He is so brilliant, he makes the teachers nervous. You'd think a kid like that would be beat up a lot, but the bad guys leave him alone. I have to find out his secret. David ignores me mostly, except when I almost ruined the $300 microscope by twisting the knob the wrong way. That was the day Miss Keene wore a purple dress with bright blue roses. Baffling. They shouldn't let teachers change like that without some kind of early warning alert. It shakes up the students. That dress was all anyone talked about for days. She hasn't worn it since. Student divided by confusion equals algebra. I slide into my desk with 10 minutes left in algebra class. Mr. Stedman stares at my late pass for a long time. I pull out a clean sheet of paper so I can copy the problems off the board. I sit in the back row, where I can keep my eye on everyone, as well as what is going on in the parking lot. I think of myself as the emergency warning system of the class. I plan disaster drills. How would we escape if the chemistry lab exploded? What if an earthquake hit central New York? 
a tornado? It is impossible to stay focused in algebra. It's not that I'm bad at math. I tested at the top of the class last year. That's how I got dad to pay for my new bike. Math is easy because there's no room for debate. The answer is right or it is wrong. Give me a sheet of math problems and I'll get 98% of them right. But I can't get my head around algebra. I knew why I had to memorize my multiplication tables, understanding fractions and decimals and percentages and even geometry. All that was practical. Tools I can use. It made so much sense, I never thought about it. I did the work, made honor roll. But algebra? Every single day, someone asks Mr. Stepman why we have to learn algebra. You can tell this causes him great personal pain. Mr. Stepman loves algebra. He is poetic about it, in an integral number sort of way. He talks about algebra the way some guys talk about their cars. Ask him why algebra, and he launches into a thousand and one stories why algebra. None of them make sense. Mr. Stepman asks if anyone can explain the Wang Diddler role in the negative Hotchka theorem. Heather has the answer. She is wrong. Stepman tries again. Me? I shake my head with a sad smile. Not this time. Try me again in 20 years. He calls me to the board. Mr. Stepman, who wants to help Melinda understand how we work our way through this problem? Rachel? Great. My head explodes with the noise of fire trucks leaving the station. This is a real disaster. Rachel Rochelle clogs up to the board, dressed in outrageous Dutch Scandinavian ensemble. She looks half cute, half sophisticated. She has red laser eyes that burn my forehead. I wear basic dumpster togs, smelly gray turtleneck, and jeans. I just this minute remember that I need to wash my hair. Blech. Rochelle's mouth moves and her hand glides over the board, drawing funny shapes and numbers. I pull my lower lip all the way in between my teeth. If I try hard enough, maybe I can gobble my whole self this way. Mr. Stepman drones on and Rochelle flutters her eyelids. She nudges me. We are supposed to sit down. The class giggles as we walk back to our seats. I didn't try hard enough to swallow myself. My brain doesn't think we should spend any time hanging around algebra. We have better things to think about. It's a shame. Mr. Stepman seems like a nice guy. Halloween. My, p my parents declare that I am too old to go trick-or-treating. I am thrilled. This way, I don't have to admit that no one invited me to go with them. I'm not about to tell mom and dad that. To keep up appearances, I stomp to my room and slam to the door. I look out my window. A group of little creatures is coming up the walk. A pirate, a dinosaur, two fairies, and a bride. Why is it that you never see a kid dressed up as a groom on Halloween? Their parents chat at the curb. That night is dangerous. Parents are required. Tall ghosts in khakis and down jackets floating behind the children. The doorbell rings. My parents squabble about who will answer it. Then mom swears and opens the door with a high-pitched, ooh, what do we have here? She must have handed out only one mini chocolate bar to each creature. Their thank yous do not sound enthusiastic. The kids cut through the yard to the next house and their parents follow in the street. Last year, our clan all dressed up as witches. We went to Ivy's house because she and her older sister had theatrical makeup. We traded clothes and splurged on cheap black wigs. Rachel and I looked the best. We had used babysitting money to rent black satin caps lined in red. We rocked. It was an unusually warm, wicked evening. We didn't need lawn underwear and the sky was clear. The wind kicked up, skimming clouds over the surface of the full moon, which was hung just to make us feel powerful and strong. We raced through the night, a clan of untouchable witches. I actually thought for a moment we could cast spells and turn people into frogs or rabbits to punish the evil and reward the good. We ended up with pounds of candy. After Ivy's parents went to bed, we lit a candle in the totally dark house. We held it in front of an antique mirror at midnight to see our futures. I couldn't see anything. This year, Rochelle is going to a party thrown by one of the exchange students' host families. I heard her talk about it in algebra. I knew I wouldn't get an invitation. I would be lucky to get an invitation to my own funeral with my reputation. Heather is walking with some of the little kids in our neighborhood so their mothers can stay home. I am prepared. I refused to spend the night moping in my room or listening to my parents argue. I checked out a book from the library, Dracula by Bram Stoker. Cool name. I settle into my nest with a bag of candy corn and the blood sucking monster. Name, name, name. In a post Halloween frenzy, the school board has come out against calling us the devils. We are now the Meriwether Tigers. Roar. The ecology club is planning a rally to protest the degrade, degrading of an endangered species. This is the only thing talked about at school, especially during class. Mr. Neck has a steroid rage, screaming about motivation and identity and sacred school spirit. We won't even make it to the industrial revolution at this rate. 
I get hosed in Spanish. Linda means pretty in Spanish. This is a great joke. Mrs. Spanish teacher calls my name. Some stand-up comic cracks. No, Melinda, no, es Linda. They call me, me no Linda for the rest of the period. This is how terrorists get started. This kind of harmless fun. I wonder if it's too late to transfer to German. I just thought of a great theory that explains everything. When I went to that party, I was abducted by aliens. They have created a fake earth and fake high school to study me and my reactions. This certainly explains cafeteria food. Not the other stuff though. The aliens have a sick sense of humor. The Marthas. Heather has found a clan, the Marthas. She is a freshman member on probation. I have no idea how she did it. I suspect money changed hands. This is part of her strategy to make a place for herself at school. I am supposed to be tagging along, but the Marthas. It's an expensive clan to run with. Outfits must be coordinated, crisp, and seasonally appropriate. They favor plaid for autumn with matching sweaters and colors named after fruit, like apricot and russet apple. Winter calls for fair, fair aisle sweaters, lined wool pants, and Christmas hair ornaments. They haven't told her what to buy for spring. I predict skirts with geese and white blouses with embroidered ducks on the collar. I tell Heather she should push the fashion envelope just a teeny bit to be an ironic reflection of the 1950s. You know, innocence and apple pie. She doesn't think the clan leaders, Meg and Emily and Siobhan, understand irony. They like rules too much. Martha's are big on helping. The name of their group came from somebody in the Bible. The original Martha clan leader became a missionary in Los Angeles. But now they follow the other Martha, Saint Martha of the glue gun, the lady who writes books about cheery decorations. Very Connecticut, very prep. The Marthas tackle projects and perform good deeds. This is ideal Heather work. She says they run the canned food drive, tutor kids in the city, host a walkathon, a dance-a-thon, and a rock and chair -a -thon to raise money for I don't know what. They also do nice things for teachers. Gag. Heather's first Martha project is to decorate the faculty lounge for a Thanksgiving party slash faculty meeting. She corners me after Spanish and begs me to help her. She thinks the Marthas could have given her a deliberately impossible task so they can dump her. I've always wondered what the staff room looks like. You hear so many rumors. Will I have a cot for teachers who need naps? Economy-sized boxes of tissues for emotional meltdowns? I wish. Comfortable leather chairs and a private butler? What about the secret files they keep on all the kids? The truth is nothing more than a small green room with dirty windows and a lingering smell of cigarettes, even though it has been illegal to smoke on school property for years. Metal folding chairs around a battered table. One wall has a bulletin board that hasn't been cleared off since Americans walked on the moon. And I look, but I can't find any secret files. They must keep them in the principal's office. I'm supposed to make a centerpiece out of the wax maple leaves, acorns, ribbon, and a mile of thin wire. Heather is going to set the table and hang the banner. She babbles on about her classes while I ruin leaf after red leaf. I ask if we can trade before I cause permanent damage to myself. Heather gently untangles me from the wire. She holds a bunch of leaves in one hand, twists the wire around the stem, one, two, hides the wire with ribbon, and hot glues the acorns into place. It's spooky. I hurry to finish the table. Heather, what do you think? Me, you are a decorating genius. Heather, eyes rolling. No, silly, what do you think about this? Me, can you believe they're letting me join? Meg has been so sweet to me. She calls me every night just to talk. She walks around the table and straightens the forks I just set. You are going to think this is ridiculous, but I was so upset last month, I asked my parents to send me to boarding school. But now I have friends, and I know how to open up my locker, and she pauses and scrunches her face up. It's just perfect. I don't have to choke out an answer because Meg and Emily and Siobhan march in, carrying trays of mini muffins and apple slices dipped in chocolate. Meg rise, raises an eyebrow at me. Me, thanks for the homework, Heather. You are so helpful. I scoot out the door, leaving it open a crack to watch what happens next. Heather stands at attention while our handiwork is inspected. Meg's pick up, she picks up the centerpiece and examines it from every angle. Meg, nice job. Heather blushes. Emily, who is that girl? Heather, she's a friend. She was the first person to make me feel at home here. Siobhan, she's creepy. What's wrong with her lips? It looks like she's got a disease or something. Emily holds out her watch. The watchman matches the bow in her hair. Five minutes. Heather has to leave before the teachers arrive. Part of being on probation means she's not allowed to take credit for her work. I hide in the bathroom until I know Heather's bus has left. The salt in my tears feels good when it stains my lips. I wash my face in the, thing, in the sink until there's nothing left of it. No eyes, no nose, no mouth. A slick nothing. Nightmare. I see it in the hallway. It goes to Meriwether. 
It is walking with Aubrey Cheerleader. It is my nightmare, and I can't wake up. It sees me. It smiles and winks. Good thing my lips are stitched together, or I'd throw up. My report card. Plays nice? B. Lunch? D. Clothes? C. Social studies? C. Biology? B. English? C. Spanish? C. Algebra? C+. Plus. Gym? C+. Plus. Art? A. So that's the first quarter of our fantastic Melinda and all of her issues. Uh, there are some questions there. I think there are three. And then don't worry. Next week, we will have another session of Mr. Vetter and um, this reading hour with your boy, V-Dog. See you soon.